So they will, where they're, they're going to get everything ready to go, and then I'll uh, go ahead and get us started. Ready to go? All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs and to uh, uh, an inaugural program for the uh, American U.S. Global Engagement uh, Program for 2018. Uh, I'm Nick Vozdev. Uh, the, uh, in this regard, my hat is to be the uh, senior fellow here at the uh, Carnegie Council uh, with regards to the uh, U.S. Engagement Program. And joining me this evening are uh, Ambassador Adrian Basora and uh, Ms. Maya Otarashvili. Uh, you have their full biographies uh, uh, there, so you can uh, get a sense of their backgrounds. But let me introduce our theme for tonight and the uh, genesis of this project and why we're meeting. Uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to uh, Adrian to start our program off. I had the opportunity a number of years ago uh, when uh, Adrian and Maya were setting up and running the uh, program on democratic transitions. They wanted to uh, take stock of what has happened with uh, U.S. efforts uh, since the end of the Cold War uh, to promote uh, democratic governance in countries around the world. Uh, and this was, of course, in the latter half of the Obama administration where it was already clear that we were seeing two trends emerge. One was a democratic recession that despite all of the predictions that came about in the 1989 to 1991 era that democracy was on the march, that there were no ideological challenges to democracy, that the entire world was moving uh, towards adopting a liberal democracy as their form of governance, uh, that it was clear uh, that by the early 2010s uh, that there was a challenge, that there was a revived authoritarian consensus, that you did not necessarily have to be a democratic country in order to have a modicum of economic prosperity, uh, to have social stability, uh, and to, to create more lasting forms of governance. Uh, the second trend that we were observing was that there was a degree of fatigue, certainly in the United States, but also in the European Union, uh, with continuing with these types of programs. Uh, certainly in the heady days of the early 1990s when it seemed that uh, the world could change in an instant moment, uh, that it wasn't going to really require a lot of resources or energy or commitment. Everyone was moving in this direction uh, and that it could be done uh, without asking uh, the peoples of the United States and of the European Union to have to commit a great deal uh, to the democracy enterprise. Then in the 2000s, uh, whether it was things like the Iraq War uh, or simply the reality that uh, some of the low-hanging fruit of the 1990s had been harvested and now the challenges for spreading democracy were becoming uh, more pronounced. They were becoming costlier. We saw a corresponding drop in interest and in support for uh, the work of democracy promotion. So this was the ground by which uh, the uh, project was being assembled, uh, its meetings, uh, its conferences produced this volume, Does Democracy Matter?, which was issued uh, right as the 2016 election campaign was beginning to heat up. Since then, of course, uh, we had the uh, election, and the election uh, produced an, an administration uh, that initially sounded very different themes uh, to what they thought should be American interest in the world and how America should conduct its foreign policy. So Donald Trump as candidate Trump, and then in his early days as President Trump, sounded very transactional themes, that the U.S. would run its policies toward and engage in the world based upon what could the U.S. get in the short term. And a theme, of course, uh, that the President ran on was this idea that the United States was on the losing end of trade deals and that international liberal institutions that create and sustain the liberal, liberal international order were simply an excuse for other countries to free ride off of the United States. Uh, the first Secretary of State in the Trump administration, Rex Tillerson, uh, came out several months into the administration and said we would not be promoting democracy anymore. We were no longer interested in uh, telling other countries how to run their affairs. We were not going to uh, encourage or support uh, democratic movements. But this was counterbalanced by trends within the administration that sounded contradictory messages. So certainly uh, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, 
Uh, now people like uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton have talked about values, have talked about the importance of uh, defending American values in the world, perhaps not necessarily in the way that previous administrations had done. Uh, the national security strategy that was issued under General McMaster with a good deal of input from Defense Secretary uh, Jim Mattis uh, talks about great power competition as being the norm, but puts an ideological cast to that great power competition, that the powers that the United States is competing against tend to be authoritarian, whereas the allies that the United States is working with tend to be democratic. So there's been some return in some parts of the administration uh, to sounding uh, the need to support democracy. So the goal of our session tonight is to try to take a pulse of where we are with the question of democracy promotion. Where does democracy promotion fit in? Is it simply about promoting American values? Does it also serve American interests? Uh, where have we come over the past 20 years? Where are we likely to go uh, both with this administration but also with subsequent administrations? Will democracy promotion remain a part of the US foreign policy agenda uh, in the years to come? Uh, Adrian, of course, uh, is uniquely uh, positioned to help start us in this conversation because he was present at the creation, really, of the uh, post-Cold War consensus, serving in the, as you see from his biography, serving on the National Security Council staff uh, from 1981, uh, no, sorry, 1989, uh, as the wall was coming down and as the United States was grappling with what to do with the post-Soviet world. And then, of course, uh, as our ambassador to the Czech Republic, uh, one of those countries which was very much seen as the harbinger of the U.S. ability to spread democracy, but also to make it sustainable. Looking, uh, I'll take then from Adrian, I'll take the conversation and move it uh, a bit to where we are today. And then uh, Maya is one of this country's rising younger scholars on Eurasian affairs uh, and has the uh, vantage point of seeing what's happening today in Central and Eastern Europe and across the Eurasian space. And of course, this discussion, uh, we had planned it before the events in Armenia happened, but now we have a case in real time of once again, uh, people frustrated by the lack of uh, accountability, by the lack of representation taking to the streets uh, and bringing down uh, what appeared to all intents and purposes uh, several weeks ago to be a, a very strong and entrenched regime in Armenia that was following along the trajectory of what we'd seen in places like Russia, uh, and instead replacing that with an opposition figure now being the new prime minister. So we have a sense of where we might go with this uh, towards the future. So uh, I hope this gives you a, a good overview of these issues, and then at the end, we'll invite everyone to be able to take part in this conversation. So Adrian, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks very much, Nick, and I very much hope it will be a conversation. And thank you all for coming out this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here and to talk about the whole process, the whole bundle of issues that Nick has so clearly laid out, and, and specifically the conclusions of this book uh, uh, called Does Democracy Matter? Uh, which is based on a project that Nick, Maya, and I worked on, but also with a number of other scholars and practitioners, the most notable of whom are uh, Carl Gershman of the National Endowment for Democracy uh, and Larry uh, Diamond of Stanford University, one of the eminent scholars worldwide on democracy, uh, and he's also editor of the Journal of Democracy. So given that this is the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs, I want to try to frame my or place my comments about our conc policy conclusions in the book in terms of values, at least partly. Uh, obviously, there are many different approaches to values, and I won't try to try cover them all. Uh, some of our scholars came to the uh, project with a point, with at least partially interested in the values dimension, myself included, but others. Uh, came primarily from a real politique kind of uh, perspective. We could put the first one on if you like, or doesn't uh, it's a, it doesn't matter for now. Um, I'll let you know. Sorry, uh, I flew up from Washington for a major conference. I flew. I, I drove down from New Hampshire. Nick came from uh, Rhode Island. Uh, 
So if there's a little uh, technical in, uh, lack of coordination, you'll understand why. Uh, but our ideas, I hope, will be clear and cogent for you. Yeah, I will when the time comes. Then. Thank you. Uh, OK, so uh, what we all agreed on, even though we came from different experiential perspectives and different, whether real politique or more, uh, more of a values perspective, we ultimately, in the end, after a considerable debate, after a conference and then writing chapters and sending them back, uh, back and forth for comment and having study groups, um, we came to the conclusion uh, that American interests are indeed well served or best served, at least in the long run, if there are more democracies in the world. Uh, so the spread and consolidation of democracy is a good thing abroad for, for us abroad. However, very importantly, we, many of us did not, or there were important areas of disagreement as to why, where, and how we should promote democracy, or even whether democratization uh, should be given priority and much priority in our bilateral relations. Uh, and Nick may comment a little bit more on that because he wrote one of the outstanding chapters in the book from the real politique point of view. Uh, my own personal view, and that I'll speak tonight from my personal view rather than try to digest everything or synthesize everything that's in the, uh, the, all the views in the book. My own view is that the strengthening democracy around the world should remain a major goal of US foreign policy. And I am convinced that this is a goal that can be justified by our ethical values as a nation. But I also believe strongly that to be fully effective, if we advocate for the support of democracy abroad, we have to take into account very powerfully the realist, the realist objections or the, uh, and the, the realist, the hard-eyed realist uh, argumentation that will ultimately be, uh, be persuasive. In my view, the health of democracy in the world is indeed deeply intertwined with our core national interests. So interests such as countering terrorism, defending ourselves militarily, our economic uh, prosperity uh, are deeply enhanced, and I'll get into the reasons why in a moment, uh, if there are more democracies in the world, if the liberal world order, which we have uh, tried to create over the last 70 years, is preserved and continues to be enhanced. However, the reason I've generally shied away from using the moral or values arguments to justify democracy support as part of US foreign policy uh, is that I've seen how glibly the opponents and the skeptics dismiss so easily these arguments, the moral arguments, uh, in effect, moral rationales are called naive. Uh, some attack democracy, also attack democracy as uh, unsustainable simply on practical grounds of budget limits. We have so many needs at home, therefore we can't afford to do much on this any longer abroad. And of course, very importantly, and that's why it's, uh, well, that, I'll get to another slide later, <laughs> the title of my talk tonight. Um, uh, it's democracy in the age of Trump. Uh, so obviously, the election 18 months ago of an administration uh, with an America first rationale as spelled out by our current president and some of his spokespersons uh, has sharply increased the need to make the, if we are to make the case for democracy abroad, supporting democracy abroad, we have to deal head on with the what I would say are purportedly realist objections. I'll spend part of my time saying why well, I think that many of the objections that are put under the cover of a realist label uh, are in fact misleading. But let's look back for a moment. For over 70 years after World War II, the US had a very clear and very consistent foreign policy with bipartisan support, political backing, uh, and the goals were these. First, encourage the spread and consolidation of democracy abroad, uh, wherever feasible. Second, and deeply related with it, I could have put it first, to counter Soviet, Chinese, and now Russian and other attempts of authoritarians to intimidate or to subvert democracy. 
either in their own countries or uh, by intimidating neighbors. However, as Nick has already said, even before the November 19, uh, 2016 election, uh, many of these longstanding bipartisan policy tenets were being increasingly called into question. And I felt, and many of us felt, that people were just talking past each other. This book resulted from a conference where we tried to get people to talk to each other from different perspectives, ideological and experiential. So here are the three uh, essentials of the misleading argument, what I consider very misleading arguments that have been used to attack the idea that the U.S. should continue to support democracy abroad as we have for 70 years. First, it doesn't matter if countries, other countries are democratic. As long as the bilateral relationship is net positive for the U.S. And of course, in measuring these bilateral relationships, all that counts is the advancement of our hard-headed national interests, such as economic, military, and counterterrorism. Therefore, democracy support, ad support advocates are dismissed, as I said, as naive moralists who lose sight of our, quote, real interests as a nation. The second argument is that the U.S. has for too long carried an unfair military and economic burden as we have assisted dem democratic allies around the world, tried to protect them, and tried to maintain the military alliances that are, have been part of the equation. And of course, supposedly, massive foreign aid programs have resulted, putting great pressure on our national budget. The third misconception uh, is that the multilateral institutions that the U.S. created after World War II, in our own likeness and image, by the way, uh, in fact, undermine American interests. Our adversaries take advantage of them uh, to exploit America economically and to undercut us politically. Those are the three arguments. It should already be clear to you that I think that all of them are deeply flawed, and I'll tell you briefly why. Uh, and in fact, it was increasingly, as I've already, uh, Nick and I both alluded to, it was the increasingly frequent, the increasing frequency with which we heard arguments of this sort that led us to the conference and to this book project. The fact is that democracy does matter. It matters deeply to our national well-being, not only to our values, but our core interests. Democracy has spread around the world far more rapidly. And now I will go to the next slide, and I'll ask Maya to help me if I uh, wait. OK, well, this, this first slide gives you a sense of how far democracy has progressed uh, as a result of that 70-year policy that I just outlined to you. Uh, Democracy in the world, as of the 1950s, there were very few democracies. Autocracies dominated, predominated when I was in college, when I entered the foreign service. That was, and democracy has spread more rapidly and more widely than most experts and pundits, pundits expected, not only in the 1950s, but even in the late Cold War years. Uh, just to give you a little more specific numbers, 45% of the, um, on the previous map, the, um, the green, uh, you can see that the green is free states, fully democratic. The yellow are partially free, partially democratic. And the, of course, the, uh, the purple are uh, autocratic. Uh, and so just geographically, you can see the spread of democracy. Here are the numbers, the graph. 45% of the world's countries are considered free, uh, fully democratic. 30% are partially free. And only 25% are authoritarian regimes. Uh, let me give you a couple more slides very, very quickly. Uh, this is the number of the decrease, very sharply small number of autocracies and partly free countries compared to the large number of democracies. Uh, this is just a teaser. But if you just look very quickly at the, the, um, the waves of democratization, the second wave. 1943 to 62, in other words, the immediate results of World War II. And then the third wave of democratization with the um, uh, latter part of the um, Cold War, but then also, very importantly, the fall of the Iron Curtain. 
there were tremendous leaps forward. We'll come back to that if you're interested in the discussion uh, as to the, the dynamics that cause these waves forward of democratization and waves backward. We are now, as you see in the, in the, in the last section of that slide, uh, in a reverse wave, quite serious and quite worrisome, but nevertheless, if you look at the historical perspective, it should be manageable uh, if, we wish, if the United States wishes to resume its role as an advocate of democracy and a supporter. Uh, so democracy has spread widely. And the world's democracies, again, as Nick already suggested, uh, they share our, the vast majority of the world's democracies share our values, have many common interests. Uh, and they're more likely to be reliable allies, and in fact, many of them are deeply committed allies. Although it's also true that not all democracies always align with us, and that some autocracies, uh, autocracies have also been uh, uh, long-term reliable allies. I don't want to make it seem simplistic. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, as you all remember, I guess you're all old enough to remember that, uh, in 1989, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union two years later were absolutely decisive triumphs for the United States and its democratic allies and the democratic values that we're talking about tonight over, uh, as over against the communist dictatorships that were once not only ideological adversaries but seriously threatening military adversaries. Again, our core national interests. So we triumphed. Why throw out that 70 year policy? We have more allies in the world now, by far, than we had before. Uh, and they are now more prosperous and more secure. We are more secure, they are more secure. Let me just see if I can get this next slide. Yes, I already told you it's a teaser. Uh, so the first misconception is that democracy uh, wasn't in our interest. The second, uh, or that, that it was not realistic to have it spread. The second misconception that I referred to at the beginning is that the, uh, is the military and the burden sharing question. It's true that the US has spent very heavily on its military uh, and uh, has worked very strongly, uh, expended great resources on building our alliances. But these alliances are very important to our common defense, not only to the defense of others, uh, and they provide substantial in addition to, uh, they provide substantial man manpower and forward basing rights that greatly leverage our own military power. So to say that it's, that we're doing, imply that we're doing it all and it doesn't help us is tremendously misleading. These allies and the bases, et cetera, are very substantial force multipliers. Uh, and therefore to diminish or quit these alliances would be obviously undercutting our own security. On the non-military side, our foreign assistance programs are in, far, in fact, as I'm sure you all know, a minuscule portion of our federal budget. Uh, and um, many of our allies provide far more democracy assistance and or general foreign aid that is, in fact, supportive of democracy uh, and transitions towards democracy around the world. The third misconception regarding uh, multilateral organizations well, as you know, out of the rubble of World War II, we built a set of international laws, norms, and institutions that mirrored our own foundational values as a nation and that have successfully maintained the peace for 73 years, in terms of world wars at least. And we created a new liberal international order that made America the world's leading economic and political power. And I would add, in my view, on balance, Admittedly, there were mistakes as well, but on balance, a force for good. And the multilateral organizations, specifically as part of that international order, such as the IMF, the World Trade Organization, NATO, and so many others, are in fact still tilted largely in favor of US interests. That's the whole reason that the Chinese, the Russians, either want to uh, try to undercut our role in them, and they we're not clever enough to at times succeed in using them against us, but mostly not, or they try to replace them with organizations that they dominate. If we let them succeed by abandoning the field of the international organizations, multilateral organizations, then we're clearly sabotaging our own interests. 
Now I'd like to turn specifically to the book, uh, and maybe I'll ask my other, would you be willing to put it back on, that initial, the final slide, which is actually <laughs> when we started with? Um, Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. Just, just because I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about the main findings of the book. Uh, so our most uh, now I'll talk for a moment about the the collective authors, even though we came at it from different perspectives and didn't necessarily agree on everything. Uh, I mean, certainly didn't agree on everything, <laughs> but we agreed on the essentials. So the first and most central recommendation of the book is that U.S. foreign policy should assign a clear and high priority to supporting the spread of democracy abroad, but recognizing, of course, that this must remain only one among several key goals in our overall national strategy. And secondly, that times have changed. It is time to review, and we recommend very specific ways in which a review of how we deliver our democracy support should be, uh, should be addressed because the challenges facing democracy today are far more complex and far more difficult than they were in the 1990s when Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history, we're, going, we're all gonna be liberal democracies. Uh, so, very importantly, in, ad in addition to a general revamping, everybody says, oh, let's study it and revamp uh, and, re and modernize our programs. We try to be very specific in very important ways. So, we advocate very precise targeting of democracy support using a carefully calibrated system of triage, a term that Nick has already uh, mentioned, and I believe he was the primary reason, uh, the primary intellect that led us to use that, uh, that specific word to describe our instincts as to how we need to do things differently. Uh, this is obvious, this is because of a number of reasons. In other, there, there are some countries in which democracy promotion programs are simply not feasible. Russia and China, very clear examples. Uh, other countries, in other countries, they can be, our programs can be counterproductive. Uh, for example, through manipulation by the local regime uh, to create a false veneer of respectability. Chapter six in our book talks about the case of Azerbaijan as an example of that. We can get into that in details. Other detail, other examples later. There are also some countries that are so critically important to other very urgently pressing national security concerns that we cannot afford to alienate the regime by pushing democracy very actively and very, um, very urgently while we're pushing other priorities. Uh, nevertheless, there are many countries in the world, around the world, where we can and should have very active approaches on the democracy front. And this is not just programmatic assistance, technical assistance, this is also leverage, persuasion, and a variety of other things. Um, and this, here we come to more, uh, both the policy of triage among countries, but also careful differentiation as to the policy tools that we use in country X, Y, Z, or A, B, C, or D. For purposes of our discussion uh, we, uh, tonight, uh, we, uh, and in the book, its conclusions, we talk about three different types of countries where there is opportunity, realistic opportunity to promote democracy in one way or another. The first group uh, that we put aside, that we try to identify is investing in the most promising new cases. I believe that the most fertile ground for encouraging democracy is often to be found in countries where autocratic regimes have recently fallen or have uh, through revolution or have agreed to a pacted transition. Uh, for ex examples of this are Ukraine, uh, talking about the development revolution period, uh, and then again now more recently, Tunisia, Indonesia. Others where uh, autocratic governments are visibly weak and uh, look likely to be replaced by a broad-based reform movement. And the most recent example, or oh, an early example of that was Poland, so the Solidarity Movement in 1989, and Armenia today looks like it could well be another example of that. So this is, presents tremendously fertile ground if we act quickly and effectively, not we only, but, but our, our Western European and other allies, uh, to help nurture and help the new reformers establish an effective democracy and a system that satisfies the citizenry of the country, terribly important. 
The second group that uh, we roughly distinguish is uh, protecting earlier gains. And I distinguish even most of it after the book was written. Uh, this is because the, of the intensity of the autocratic resurgence problem that we've seen over the past decade. So uh, given the aggressive nature of the current authoritarian offensive, we need to safeguard existing democracies, either in cases like Poland and Hungary where an internal autocrat is trying to subvert democracy, uh, or from foreign attempts to weaken, subvert, or otherwise uh, eliminate them. And recent, in recent times, Bulgaria and Bosnia have come to mind as examples of, in this case, Russian attempts to undercut democracy from outside. The third group, and a very, very important one, and one that it doesn't get anywhere near, in my view, the attention that it deserves in the general press, or even in, in certain parts of the academic world or in the policy world, and that is the need to deal opportunistically with hybrid regimes, or what uh, Stephen Levitsky and Luke and Wei call competitive authoritarian regimes. Their book, which has that title, is an extraordinary, one of the, to me, the canons of democratic transition theory and uh, practical, uh, practical policy. So these are the countries that form, that, that so fall somewhere between democracy and dictatorship. Uh, and they generally, and they're run by uh, uh, autocratic elites who feel it necessary in order to maintain the legitimacy uh, to maintain important tra significant trappings of democracy, uh, such as uh, elections that have some semblance of competition, uh, such as uh, permitting international travel and educational exchanges. Uh, they leave space for some degree of private economic initiative or media and, or other forms of openness of some civil society. And these regimes, some of them are viewed generally as you know, rock solid authoritarian. In fact, many of them are much less durable than they appear. Armenia, perfect reason, exa reasonable example, recent example. They're either because they're, they're unstable ultimately even be either because their elites can easily split, their splits within the elite, or one form or another of blatant manipulation, in the case of Armenia, electoral manipulation, prime minister to president back and forth, the old Putin trick, uh, can produce very strong pushback. In this case, a revolution that produced a, minor, a prime minister of the opposition. So there can be op unanticipated opportunities for democratization. In this case, we and our allies need to be very quick very nib nimble and agile in stepping in and helping the reformers create democracy in that country. Uh, but even in the autocratic, uh, the, these hybrid regimes where uh, there isn't a split and there isn't an uh, opportunity for major democracy support programs, there's still room for educational exchanges, uh, business exchanges, other scientific exchanges, other things that help lay the seeds for democracy and we should not neglect doing that. Now, beyond our, the bilateral approaches that these three groupings uh, imply, uh, we, is the multilateral front. And there, we need to make far greater use of the international organizations that we ourselves created. Uh, their charters and the multiple, re hundreds of res thousands even of resolutions over these 70 years that support human rights, support rule of law, support the, the values and the, and the institutions that underlie demo undergird democracy. We should use them more, not demean them, not denigrate them, use them more effectively. Okay, now let me close with a couple of final points. And again, this, this is, and now I will try to put it back more into the ethical context that I promised to try to uh, pay attention to in this presentation. Uh, when I began my professional career, career in the 1960s, after 16 years of a liberal, education that included considerable attention to ethical issues. 18, uh, eight, eight of those years were Jesuit education. Um, and these were liberal Jesuit, uh, Jesuits. Um, uh, so at the time, based on that education, at the time I entered the, foreign the American Foreign Service, it was the intention of pursuing what I understood to be bilateral, uh, bipartisan goals in foreign, foreign policy. You know, policy that I've already outlined, that I also saw as deeply compatible with my own personal ethical principles. Once in government, I also learned 
that the actual implementation of these policies is, is sometimes imperfect, and at other times the government actually strays from for longer periods. However, I always found that impossible. To, always found it possible to advocate for change from within, and I was always satisfied to see not just as a result of internal advocacy that we eventually got back on track during these 70 years. There were ups and downs, but the general trend was fairly consistent and, uh, and did the right thing. Now, our own democracy, democracies around the world are under systematic attack from, from outside and from some internal voices. And so is the liberal international order that I've described that it has brought, in my view, so much good to the world. Therefore, a failure to counter this current authoritarian offensive would, in my view, clearly be a failure to defend our own democracy, all of its values, all of its security. And it would mean an abandonment of the international institutions uh, that we rely on for so much of our military and economic security, uh, as well as our leadership in the world. So American democracy, support for democracy in the world is a clear-eyed decision to protect our own core national interests, but also justified by profoundly ethical considerations in our foreign policy. Democracy for all its faults is ultimately a better system of government for a majority of individuals. And the inherent worth of the individual and his or her rights are the core of the ethical system to which I adhere and to which I believe most Americans adhere. The opposite side of the coin is authoritarianism. Downgrades individual rights, We've seen with fascism and the, the brutality and uh, that occur, can occur in, in fascist examples of the 30s, the Stalinist and Maoist regimes, uh, and the brutality of a Putin or a Mugabe more recently. Uh, as long, as, in my view, as long as the U.S. does not abandon the field for too long, I still believe that democracy of the world can manage to overcome this anti-democratic trend of the past decade and the authoritarian offensive that we're now facing and that there is not only hope, but a probability that we can succeed. And if so, our support of democracy in the world is not only in our national self-interest and the interest of others in the world, it's clearly the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend. So I'll pick up the conversation uh, here and talk a little bit more about the triage concept and then turn it over to Maya. Uh, the idea of democratic triage, which came out of this project, uh, is rooted in the American realist tradition, Hans Morgenthau and others, about prudence, about not just simply pursuing policies because they make you feel good or because your intentions are good, but because you have a reasonable assumption that they may succeed and that they may produce something better than what was there before. And I think what's happened when we were writing and working on this project and, and since then is really to illustrate the importance of prudence as part of this approach. That we may feel that the world should be democratized now. We have to balance it against resources, capabilities, and as we've seen, there are some real issues in the U.S. national security system uh, that we have to address. One of them is, of course, the question of persistence, of being able to do things over a much longer time frame. One of the things that has changed since, Adrian, you started in the Foreign Service, uh, is the idea of a bipartisan consensus that outlasts individual presidential administrations. So we just have had the example this week of uh, a president reversing course on a major policy initiative of his predecessor, which sends the signal that essentially everything is up for grabs. One president comes in, another one comes in, policies change. There was a time when presidents started policies that they knew they would not see the benefits from. Harry Truman started policies that he would not benefit from personally in the elections of 1948 or 1950, and of course he chose not to run again, and even though he was eligible to for 1952. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower started policies 
that he could not run on in 1956 or claim credit for in 1958. Today, we have a political culture that if you don't see results within 18 months, you don't pursue them. You want to be able to say, what have I done as a president, or what has my party done in the Congress? And the idea that someone may get the credit 20 years down the road uh, is increasingly anathema in our political system. But it makes this process of democratization, which is by definition a long-term investment of time, of resources, of energy, more difficult to sustain if people's time frame in Washington is what are the metrics for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, anything beyond that I'm less interested in. Triage forces you also to not to, to have to tell people no. And one of the things I've seen over the last number of years has been unfortunate, an unfortunate validation of the triage concept, which is what's happened in Tunisia. Tunisia was a very promising case for democratization. We had all of the ingredients for breakthrough. And then what happened is people said, well, Tunisia is important, but Egypt is important. Sudan is important. Poland is important. Armenia is important. Azerbaijan is important. All of these different demands and where concentrated resources could have made that breakthrough in Tunisia last and endure, we didn't put enough resources into it because there were too many programs, too many claims. Triage forces you to sometimes tell people you have a claim, you are struggling for your rights, you are struggling for freedom. We can't help you at this point in the process. We need to put resources where they can do the most good. But instead, we, and this is the, the chapter on Azerbaijan, we spent a lot of money in Azerbaijan helping the existing government burnish its democratizing credentials without getting much of a return on that. Tunisia, we fell short. We didn't have the resources to spend there that we could have. Triage also is to encourage people not to and again, telling people no is important because, and this is something that Alan Cooperman had already recognized more than two decades ago, when you convey the impression that the United States is going to support everyone at all times, what it means is the United States supports no one with any degree of results. But it may lead people to think that cavalry is going to be coming to their aid when there's no cavalry coming across the, across the hills. We've un unfortunately, this is less a democracy promotion question, but unfortunately we've seen the results of this in Syria, where a Syrian opposition that for years believed that if they only held out long enough, the intervention was coming. Six years later, millions of Syrians displaced from their homes, hundreds of thousands of people killed. Uh, even with the latest individual pinprick strikes that the United States has launched, it hasn't been uh, a result that uh, encouraged that by struggling and holding out for that, the end result has been a humanitarian catastrophe uh, in Syria and then, of course, in the region as a whole. So triage forces you to actually have to be honest, not only with your own people, but with others about what the US is prepared to do, the limits of our support, what we can achieve. Uh, and then if we can encourage, in some cases, as, as Adrian pointed out, in some cases we can encourage longer term evolutionary change. It might not be immediate. It might not satisfy that I want change now. But if we can do what we did in East Asia, where the reason why, as the map showed for, East, for the world, why we have more free and partially free countries in East Asia, is that there was an evolutionary approach. It wasn't a all or nothing, everything has to happen this month. We built institutions. We trained people. We gave incentives for existing elites to be prepared to surrender power or to be prepared for the risk of losing power without facing retribution, whether it was in South Korea, where Ultimately, former political prisoners became elected presidents of their country. Or we saw in Taiwan, or we saw in Malaysia or Indonesia. These are important evolutionary steps. They took time, but they occurred, and they have been more or less 
they haven't always advanced as quickly as we would like. At least there hasn't been that degree of democratic recession. This is also a way, of course, of rebuilding that core American support because one of the things that Adrian pointed out is that whether the, those arguments are true or not, they're believed by people. They're believed by voters. American voters consistently believe that we spend more than 25% of the federal budget on foreign aid. Not true, but it's a belief, and that guides people's attitudes. Uh, what we've seen in, again, the way that the Iraq war was sold uh, will have long-lasting repercussions. That's made Americans much more suspicious of grand projects to remake the world. And what's been happening with Afghanistan, where 18 years later, Afghanistan still doesn't look much better than it did when the intervention started is causing a degree of erosion of American support. Triage can help to address that by saying we're not going to be everywhere at all times, but we're going to try to concentrate where we can do the most good and where it's good for our values and good for our interests. So I think that this is an important uh, approach. Whether this administration buys into it or not, we'll see. Uh, we've already seen two shifts in the national security team so far. Uh, we don't know how uh, it will play out over the coming months, who will still be in key positions, what happens with the midterm elections. As Adrian pointed out, we may have a period of time where we can figure these things out here without too much long-term damage to the cause of democracy, but uh, we'll have to see what happens there. But I wanted to turn the floor now to Maya because we are seeing real-time impacts while the United States is figuring this out at home, and while we are trying to figure it out, the rest of the world is not waiting, and authoritarians are not waiting to see what the United States does. And so, Maya, if you can take our conversation forward uh, with what's happening, particularly in East Europe and the Eurasian space. Thank you, Nick. And uh, I want to take the moment to thank you for, for inviting us and, and thank the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs for hosting us. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, so one of the reasons why, why this subject matter is so important at the moment is because there is a sense of urgency. Um, and where is that sense of urgency coming from? Well, I, I have the pleasure of working on the Eurasia region. And what better way to justify um, engagement than to look at the Eurasia region? So I, I want you to just for a moment, for context, consider this. For the past 18 years, Vladimir Putin has been the, the leader of Russia in one way or another. And the whole time, he has been complaining about how the world is so unipolar. Um, you know, democracy has been the only game in town. The Western liberal democracy is diffusing into the rest of the world. And, you know, Russia has to kind of live with that. Um, but also think about what he has managed in the past eight, 18 years. He has brought his country out of this limbo that, that was caused by the implosion of the USSR. Um, he has managed to establish a strong Russia and in his third presidency, so the, 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 the recent few years, we've, see, we've seen a rise of a, a very aggressive, very openly anti-democratic, unapologetic Russia that has challenged that status quo. So there is a new sh sheriff in town. Democracy is no longer the only game, particularly in the Eurasia region. And you know he is a, a formidable um, opponent that we have got to consider. And the reason why have, we have to consider him is, is you know, sort of multi, multi-fold. One of them being the fact that Russia, Russia's presence, Russia's aggression in the Eurasia region is, is undoing um, the, the gains that we made during the time that we were promoting democracy in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and, and I'll go in, into that a little bit, and I'll tell you the places that Adrian and Nick talked about, uh, particularly in Central Europe, um, democracy turned out to be very fragile there. Yes, we made gains, but we're losing. Um, more than that, now uh, he has knocked on our own door. Um, so we can really no longer afford to turn a blind eye when, when Putin invades Georgia or invades Ukraine because he is now... Um, He's now running a psychological warfare over here. So um, in the era of great division uh, within the United States, um, we have so much domestic chaos, so we're looking inwards. We also have this 
increasingly indifferent and ineffective bureaucratic European Union. So what, what are we left with in, in Eurasia? And again, I think this is a good example to understand what's at stake. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the trends that we're noticing in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Um, so I have three, three areas I want you to consider. One starts with the anxious Democrats. Um, that would be the Baltic states, for example, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Um, while Freedom House, by the way, this map is from, from Freedom House Nations in Transit. I want to thank them for their excellent work that we get to take advantage of all the time, um, including this map. Um, Freedom House reports that you know, the nations in transit, the post-Soviet states that they've been monitoring for so many years now, are rapidly declining this year. Again, Freedom House has marked you know, historic declines in democracy scores. Yet, within the Baltic states, we have the three consolidated democracies and Estonia, although it was already a, a strong democracy, has somehow managed to improve its democracy scores even further. So it's not all doom and gloom. However, so here, here we have the, the Baltic leaders coming to the White House, meeting with Donald Trump, President Trump. And you know, one of their biggest fears is, the, is you know, will, will NATO uh, stand by its Article 5? Um, obviously, they, they are bordering Russia very closely. So there is a very serious national security concern there. So as much as the Baltic states are, are um, you know, standing by their democratic values, uh, they, they, their national security is very much endangered by this um, sort of strong Russia that has risen over, risen over the few years. So we have our anxious Democrats. Um, what's really interesting is that we also have these liberal Europeans. We talked about places where we have succeeded with our democracy promotion efforts and the billion do billions of dollars that we spent. Um, over there, you can see the Polish leader, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, and then you can see Viktor Orban. Um, Poland and, and Hungary are regressing rapidly. The other day, I overheard a colleague of mine, Dan Kalman, uh, declare that Hungary is no longer a democracy. So we, we are seeing this embrace of illiberal values in places like Poland and Hungary. Um, you know, the methods that they're using uh, are very interesting because a lot of them are somewhat directly borrowed from Putin's Russia. These methods have been tried and tested. For example, I'll give you an example of Hungary. Uh, because, um, you know, I think it was about four years ago, my colleague and I wrote this, this article for FPRI arguing that, um, you know, Europe should really do something about Orban because he's having these authoritarian tendencies. Here we are, he was just reelected um, for his, I want to say, fourth term as, as the leader of Hungary. Um, and, and he's using these methods, which are very reminiscent of Putin's Russia. He has just declared all these NGOs as undesirable organizations that are threatening, you know, Hungary's way of life. Um, and, and that's something that Putin did very successfully recently. He, he has um, attacked the, the rule of law. The constitutional court is very much um, sort of run by Orban to his preference at this point. Um, and, and the assaults on the media and, and, and the education system, this is straight out of the authoritarian playbook um, that Putin has been using so successfully in, in Russia. Um, we're seeing very similar trends in Poland as well. Uh, but what's interesting, that the reason, this is not, I, I'm sure most of you, if you follow Eurasia, you're aware of these things. But what I want to point out is that in the absence of strong resolve, strong Western leadership, these leaders, these individuals can consolidate the status quo. Um, like I said, Orban was just re-elected. Uh, the Kaczynski government is going to be re-elected very soon. Poland has elections coming up. No one questions the fact that they will be re-elected. So we're, we're witnessing this sort of easing into the status quo. We are becoming comfortable with this idea of embracing um, illiberal values, to quote Orban. Um, it gets worse. Uh, we are seeing uh, comfortable oligarchs if you move a little bit further east. So we talked about the hybrid regimes, the, the low-hanging fruit. Yes, even if you apply the triage method, the first place you can go to, to, to assist democratic transitions are the, the hybrid states. Hybrid states happen to be 
uh, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine. Um, yesterday, I, came, I, I attended this day-long um, Georgia conference in Washington where the head of the Georgian Association in America said that over the past 25 years, we've spent approximately $3 billion on assisting Georgia's post-Soviet transition, presumably towards democracy. But here we are. Freedom House, here are the quotes that I have. Uh, Freedom House is reporting that in the hybrid states and, and beyond in Central and Eastern Europe, we are now seeing this trend of, of informal leadership, individuals who happen to be running the show from behind the scenes. So if you consider Vizina Ivanishvili, who overthrew, famously overthrew the uh, increasingly authoritarian Saakashvili government in Georgia and, and became prime minister, um, he then stepped down just a couple of years later. Um, this is not my opinion. He's been running the show <laughs> ever since his Georgian Dream Coalition came into power in Georgia. What does that mean? Everyone in the party in the high-ranking positions um, actually work for his many companies. He, he's the richest man in Georgia, but also arguably in, in, in most of Eastern Europe. Um, he, he ha he's been known to appoint the prime ministers and appoint the different ministers and then remove them and then replace them. Um, just recently, he has decided to step back into the limelight and he has now again become the uh, chairman of the, the Georgian Dream Party, which again is, is, the, the, is the ruling party in Georgia. Um, I should also point out that he's been able to um, pretty much turn Georgia into his, his backyard. So um, has an, a big affinity for ancient trees digs them up, moves them to his property, purchases botanical gardens for a nominal dollar. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? Then we have our uh, Vlad Lahotnyuk, who is uh, a very sim similar character, but in Moldova. Again, another hybrid state. Lahotnyuk is also a, a millionaire oligarch who lives in Moldova and is a chairman of the ruling party. Um, he too has been known to run the show um, sort of above, above the level of his formal title. Um, and then we have uh, Poroshenko, Ukraine's president. He's not alone. Ukraine is much bigger than Georgia and, uh, and Ukraine. So um, there, there, there is more than one oligarch in charge there. But Poroshenko is the fourth wealthiest um, man in Ukraine. And he has been recently making headlines for, for his unwillingness to uh, form a meaningful anti-corruption body in Ukraine. Uh, and, and we are hearing now in the past year or two that Ukraine's reforms have seriously stalled and, and um, we don't know how much democratic hope there is for Ukraine anymore. Um, so again, what matters here <laughs> is the idea that this has been happening for a while, but now that there is an alternative, there is no one really watching over their shoulders, right? Because America is too busy looking inwards. Europe is too busy looking at itself, dealing with the effects of Brexit or even the effects of all the Russian meddling that, that we've seen. So um, while that happens, uh, these types of individuals just manage to consolidate the status quo and ease into this seemingly tra tra transitory position. Um, so I think that that is really alarming. Again, think about the years of gains and investments that we've made. I, I'm, I'm not saying let's run all of our democracy promotion programs at full force, but it, it may be worth protecting our investments in, in this region. Of course, we have the winners. Here is <laughs> Vladimir Putin, first and foremost. That's a picture of him at his, his inauguration into his fourth term as president of Russia. He will now be the second longest ruler of Russia since Stalin. Um, and uh, what can we expect from Putin 4.0? I would say more of the same. He will continue to challenge um, this idea of, of um, spreading democracy um, in, in Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Moreover, again, the idea that you now have more players in the game means that you get to, um, you don't have to rely on Western assistance only that comes with this heavy burden of conditionality. Um, you know, austerity measures that you must implement in order to become a better democracy. That's no longer necessary. China is very happy to invest in, your, in these countries. And, and you know, China has, has different conditions that are perhaps less painful upfront in the, in the short to midterm. Um, 
So we talked about the Armenia opening, and, and again, this is a very good example to justify the idea that, okay, here's low-hanging fruit. Let's see what we can do. Um, it's interesting that uh, Mr. Pashinyan, who, who replaced the, uh, the outgoing or, or, or the, the peacefully outgoing uh, Sargsyan, um, one of the first people who called him to congratulate him was Vladimir Putin. Um, I cannot quite tell you where the U.S. has been in, in this whole picture, but this is our opportunity to jump in and see if we can shift the status quo in the Caucasus that has, has been regressing um, quite rapidly and, and looking more and more towards, in Armenia's case, the Eurasian Economic Union rather than the European Union. Um, so with that, I, I abbreviated my talk. I have a lot more information, but I'm mindful of the time. So, uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer any more questions about the countries that I, I kind of glossed over really quickly. But um, he's happy, I think. <laughs> well, thank you, Maya. I think we uh, take some questions from the, uh, from the audience. I think we need you to go to the microphone so that we can, because we are live streaming uh, and we'll be recording this so for people not here. And if you could just identify who you are and direct your question to, please. My name is Larry Bridwell and I teach international business at Pace University and I very much enjoyed that chart on democracy. And there are 500 million people, if you currently include the United Kingdom, in the European Union, 330 million Americans, isn't the future of Eurasia primarily the responsibility of the European Union? And shouldn't the United States, in effect, play a secondary role and let Europe deal with democracy in Eurasia? I was given this other oh. microphone, but this is. Yeah, why wouldn't you go first? Okay. Uh, it would be ideal if Europe was strongly led and, uh, and doing what you say they should do. Uh, if, and I think the con constellation of forces in Europe actually would move in that direction if they had an ally across the Atlantic who were in, which was encouraging them to do it or helping them to do it. They should, in my view, I think you, you make a very good point. They should have the primary responsibility. Should we have pulled away so quickly? Uh, should we have called into question whether we're going to, I mean, Europe cannot stand up to Russia militarily without us. That was called into question by the current administration at its very beginning. Uh, this is a little bit disjointed, but the point is they're not doing it yet. They won't do it without some significantly greater encouragement and assistance from the United States. It needs to be done. Therefore, lamentably, perhaps, we should do more to make sure it gets done. We should certain that should certainly include encouraging them to do the lion share. Now, having said that, the extraordinary uh, blossoming of democracy in the former Eastern Europe and some of the former Soviet republics was tremendously enhanced by the prospect of EU membership. The EU poured in and continues to pour in huge resources to make a success, an economic success of those transitions. Uh, and uh, so it's not black and white that they're doing nothing. But they, clearly you're right, they're not doing enough. And they won't do enough until they get their act together more fully. And it'll depend on whether uh, Macron, the Macron, uh, the, 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 the Berlin-Paris uh, axis becomes more effective. Uh, th there is some prospect possibility of that, particularly when they get Brexit out of the way. Uh, but if the United States is absent, it's going to take a very much longer to have an effect. It may be too late in some cases when the consolidations that Maya has, uh, has already uh, described are even more fully entrenched in Poland and Hungary, much harder to reverse. Yeah, I, I 
just your microphone isn't picking up. I, I just want to add that um, the countries I just talked about, at least half of them, they are Europe. They themselves are suffering, and if we if we think about um, Europe's democracy promotion efforts. We, our, our book extensively talks about this. Poland and Hungary are part of Visegrad 4. They have made, they have a history of promoting democracy in Eastern Europe and beyond. Um, but the truth is right now they themselves are in crisis. Um, and and we, we led this idea. The United States essentially created this idea of helping Europe be uh, lead by example, re lead the rest of Eastern Europe or the rest of the post-Soviet space um, into, into democracy. So I think that we have this history of leading Europe um, in, in its democracy promotion efforts and, and um, European fragility right now doesn't allow for, for that kind of leadership. So um, again, I'm, by no means, I'm, I'm not arguing, let's pour all of our money into promoting democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. My argument is it's starting to have national security implications for this country. And that's something we should really consider. Let me just throw in a quick plug for the Global Engagement Programs podcast with Andrew Mikta uh, from a month and a half ago, which is also available on the US Global Engagement portion of the Carnegie uh, ethics site, so that also, he is also addressing this question from his perch in Germany, this question of the breakdown of the transatlantic alliance and its impact on democratic recession. Follow, uh, my name is Sam Rosen. Following up on that question, didn't we go a long way toward shattering catastrophically the relationship between the United States and the democratic countries of Europe by pulling out of the Iran deal and basically telling Europe, you're on your own, um, not listening to May or Merkel or Macron. Um, basically, we've said, we don't care about what you have to say, um, and we're just going to do what we're going to do. Do you want to answer that? So it's a point to be considered because the uh, transatlantic relationship is under is under strain. Uh, certainly, you know one of the initial reactions to the U.S. pulling out of the Iran deal will be it's a lot harder now to tell Germany why it should continue with any sanctions on Russia, particularly on energy programs. Uh, and uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron came here with his pitch to the president, asking saying we want some more time. We can try to fix the deal. Uh, he got the word that we'd be pulling out. And that weekend, he announced it's time for France to have its historic new dialogue with Russia. So uh, you're on to something here that there's a split potentially occurring in the transatlantic relationship, whereas a lot of these gains in the 90s were made and 2000s were made because the US and Europe were united and on the same page. And we're no longer on the same page. Paris as well. I, you talked about the Iran Accord, but I would also date this back to the uh, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords, I think, started this. And then the uh, trade sanctions haven't helped either. So but does that, does that make things? Uh, uh, yes, it does. I fully agree with Nick. It makes things much worse. Uh, we're talking about what we should do as a nation longer term. Uh, I don't think it's impossible. There was a tremendous split between the United States and many of the Western European countries when we entered the, uh, when we did the Iraq intervention in 2003. There was a, a very similar split to what you're seeing now. Uh, and it was repaired afterwards. Uh, and we can repair this damage, but it, you're absolutely right. It does significant damage. Um, but, you know, in this response to the earlier question as well, the fact that damage has been done you know, the fact that there's a breach in the dike or that somebody's not doing his or her part to, doesn't mean that doesn't affect our interest and that we shouldn't try to do something about it. Those of us who believe in the kind of, uh, in, the, in the vision for our foreign policy that we have, all three of us, spoken about should try in their own ways and in their own spheres to help move us back towards a bipartisan understanding of what our long-term national interest is. And only then, and only then will there be consistency in our foreign policy. 
it's, it's, a, it's a monumental task. I don't believe in giving up easily. Well, it, and you assume that the president's interest now is America's interest, and he doesn't owe something to Mr. Putin at this point. I don't understand that. I understand your point. Your, your microphone isn't picking you up. It, the fact that, that, that Trump is paying off Putin for helping get him elected. It's certainly a possibility. Hi, my name is Philip Ellison. I'm a uh, communications specialist. Um, per, uh, Ambassador Basora, I wanted to ask you maybe to speculate a little bit. Um, you know, at the time of the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, uh, we had the New World International Order, and it was, everyone was very positive about what was going on. The, the wall had come down. The Soviet Union was dissolving. Um, and then we had Desert Storm. We, um, you know, we left Saddam Hussein in power. Um, I, I think that the 90s was a period that, it, and of course then Bush lost re his re-election campaign. I think we're, we, we haven't really examined the 90s thoroughly enough to understand the roots of what's going on today. And I think it's a crucial time where we somehow lost our mojo at, at a very crucial time in, in world history. Um, and I'm not sure that the Hussein situation and the Iraq situation was specifically the most you know, egregious example or the, or the best emblematic case, but certainly leaving a strong man in power who was really not democratic and who had no real democratic support, um, and then you know, and then uh, the, the, what followed the creation of Al Qaeda, et cetera, um, in that in that period of the '90s. Could you talk about what might have happened had Bush won re-election? I mean, what was yeah. we were on? We were on kind of a an upward tick, and then things seemed to fall apart. Well, <laughs> uh, as vain as it may sound, I think you asked the right person because I served in the, as you probably know from my bio. Uh, I served in the Bush 41 White House at the National Security Council. And then, uh, after I retired from the foreign service, then I went out to Prague and was ambassador to Czechoslovakia for the, during the Velvet Divorce and then stayed as ambassador in Prague. But after that, I became president of Eisenhower Fellowships, whose chairman was George H.W. Bush. I got to know him pretty well, both a little bit at the, at the White House and then subsequently. Uh, yes, there's no question. He, to me, he is, I should start by saying that I should have prefaced this by saying that I am an independent. I'm not a Democrat or Republican, and I took the hatchet very, I took the um, nonpartisanship of a career, anybody in the career government service very seriously, and I take it today for other reasons. So my, what I'm about to say is not a partisan comment. Uh, in my view, uh, Bush 41 was one of the great foreign policy presidents of all time in the United States. Not perfect, but he got most things right. He and Brent Skokoroft, who was the best national security advisor we've ever had in my view, they got together, they saw the troops. I was there, you know, I was seeing it too, <laughs> and hearing directly what, you know, the conversations indirectly, hearing the conversations between Skokoroft and Bush. So they saw these troops, Desert Storm, they saw the uh, Iraqi army in full retreat. They saw that we were already beginning to destroy them and that it was mass slaughter. They saw that occurring on television. And they said, we cannot, we as a nation cannot engage in this degree of mass slaughter. It is against our values. We had formed a coalition. Remember, the Gulf War coalition was an extraordinary success story in terms of multilateralism. We got the UN sanctioned for it. We got the, lots of Arab countries, the Egyptians and many others, to participate in it. Um, and, uh, it was, but so, so the I, President Bush's idea was to maintain support for that. And he thought that he would lose that global support that the US leadership role in the world required that he, we be restrained and not simply remove Assad al Hussein. We went in for a reason. We had a UN resolution that said we've got to reverse the invasion of the country. It didn't say you have a, a mandate to unseat Saddam Hussein. Uh, compare that to the Libya situation. 
uh, that, that's an imperfect comparison. But, so, but fast forward, what happens next? You get President Clinton coming in on a, on a uh, uh, the reason that, uh, that, that, in my view, Bush lost, Bush 41 lost the election was, as Clinton put it, it's the economy, stupid. We have been so successful internationally, but things were, you know, we were in a recession, we're just coming out of a recession, low, high unemployment, and Clinton was a very smart, highly charismatic politician who played that, just like our current president has played up to the fears and concerns of many Americans, understandable fears and concerns. Problem is that it took Clinton two years to learn foreign policy. I saw him in action. He came. It's in my uh, it, when I was ambassador in Prague. He he had a summit with all the the four Visegrad countries, the president with Havel and uh, Wałęsa and the other the leaders of the four of Poland, Hungary, Czech, Slo Czech and Slovak Republic. And uh, I saw him in action. By that time, this is January of '94. He he had already learned a lot about foreign policy, and he became in many ways a good foreign policy president, but we had lost a lot of momentum. And we had, sw and then, you get Bush 43, um, knows nothing about foreign policy, and was avenging his father. Because remember, there had been a, a, uh, an assassination attempt against his father. In his mind, he had to finish the job. Uh, well, apart Unfortunately, the evidence wasn't there of the nuclear proliferation, uh, the, that uh, the nuclear um, arms being developed, the arms of mass destruction, including chemical. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 so what would have happened had Bush 41 stayed in office, I think he would have been far more effective in pursuing the logic Yes, yes, we intervene, but we use the mandate that we have from the UN. We also are loyal to our allies. Do not alienate them in the way you just pointed out with the Iran agreement. Uh, he would have, he, you know, he was on the phone all the time. I was, I, I was writing his talking points for many of his conversations with Francois Mitterrand, who had been highly anti-American, but uh, when he saw what was happening, what Saddam Hussein was doing in, on the verge of invading Saudi Arabia and having taken over Kuwait. He said, no, no, we need, we, we, he was one of the strongest members of that Gulf coalition. You know, the, the exact opposite. So, uh, oh, what's happening now? And acting together, you saw the tremendous force of what we were able to achieve. The U.S. has tremendous leadership potential. We've, we've wasted it, we've, um, we've misused it at times. We can regain it, but only if we have a vision, A, that is consistent. Over, over over different administrations, and that's a that's a hard slog, a tall order. And secondly, if we have alliances, if we are with Europe, their 500 million people, as, as you pointed out, uh, our 330, our GDPs together, not only tremendously out, uh, and our military potential, including all their contributions, the military that I alluded to, so totally out, out outweigh Russia that Russia has nothing if we're united, but we're not. And then there's the other menace to democracy and, and our values, and that's China, which is so successful economically. And given that we're giving such a poor example of democratic leadership in the world ourselves, running our own democracy, and then being the leader of the democratic uh, countries of the world and the democratically created institutions of the world, uh, uh, you know the Chinese are, gonna, are walking all over us, and we'll and we'll do so more unless we get our act together. A, in terms of American leadership, standing for what we did for seventy years, and secondly, re 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 uh, cementing our alliances. But we were able to do that very quickly after, despite the deep uh, um, the deep hurts that we created, or the deep damage that we created when we talked when Donald uh, Rumsfeld talked about. You know the um, the old Europe and Europe the new and Europe, Europe, et cetera. Uh, you know, once in the next administration, it was able. To, uh, we we uh, we we restored those relationships very very quickly, and used them in some ways to good. I think we could have done more. In Libya, for example, we should have had a more a law, a policy that follows through, not just does step one, but does step two. And if we had created a model of intervention that really established a democracy or a, a, a decent government and, and, and 
and no chaos in, in Libya, well, the prospects of Tunisia would be a lot better. Maybe things could have even gone differently in, in, in Egypt. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but since you asked about H.W. Bush, I felt that I would want to share with you my personal observations. But thank you for asking the question. Well, we go with the last uh, question. Yeah. My name is Yuri Yermagayev. I mentioned... Could you speak closer to the mic? Yeah. My name is Yuri Yermagayev, and I mentioned one of my former titles, which is most relevant to today's uh, panel. I was a founder and president of the Center for Democracy in the USSR, which I founded in 1984 and which w very successfully mm -hmm. carried out its programs. It was major recipients of NED grants, which you mentioned today, Carl Gershman. We planned this together. And that's very relevant to the what I'll ask and say now and to the word realistic and realist, which you use so often, all three of you, because at that moment, most people believe that it was completely unrealistic to go for this project for democracy, democratization of the Soviet Union. They proved to be totally wrong. We proved to be right, because the project programs worked well, and we went into period of glasnost perestroika, supporting many people before and during there, and before the communist, communism collapsed in the Soviet Union. Now, here is why it's important in context of what I heard. Here is your sentence, which I have some problem with. Authoritarian regimes are at the other end of the spectrum. Now, I believe that on the other end of the spectrum are and always have been totalitarian regimes. And I make very important distinction between those two. And it's particularly important when we want to make the case that promoting democracy and democratization is an issue of national security. Because our major enemies always were and still are totalitarian states. And if we want to make issue of democratization and promoting democracy as a national security issue, we first of all need to address states which are our major enemies. And all our wars, all terrorism, all other problems which we have for the last hundred years come from totalitarian states. Would it be Nazism, which is totalitarian, and I say the word Nazism, not fascism, intentionally. Would it be communism? Would it be Iranian Islamism now? Those all problems came from them. So in your case, you kind of put them aside. I understand that it's an extremely difficult task to promote democracy in those countries. But we still have our major enemies in Pekin and in Tehran, which are both totalitarian states, and China still remain communist totalitarian state, and Iran is totalitarian state. And to me, and because I did the same thing with the Soviet Union, I, still, I think that there are very realistic opportunities and important opportunities to have very strong programs promoting democratic ideas and support people such as dissidents in all those countries. And this is an issue of the national security. And we will have problems with those countries as long as those totalitarian regime exists there because they will carry ideological war against us. They cannot do otherwise. It's a requirement of the ideology. We cannot negotiate it. We cannot, we can only help to topple down those regimes. But we shouldn't do it with any military force. It should be done with peaceful offensive, mm -hmm. as Ronald Reagan did in case of the Soviet Union. And promoting democracy is a major tool of such peaceful offensive, because we need to counter the ideologies which are there with ideas of democracy. So that's why I think that our priority in promoting democracy should be first and foremost with totalitarian states. Poland and Hungary, with all the problems which we may 
have are not our strong enemies, and it's very difficult to make case for national security if we would be concerned only about Poland and Hungary and kind of drop Iran, Cuba, China from this consideration. As difficult as it may look and it may be, I believe they should be the priority in our promotion of democracy programs. Okay. Aiden, well, there's the an important, uh, important distinction. I, uh, totalitarian, I spoke about a spectrum. And totalitarian regimes are at the far end of the authoritarian spectrum. And certainly, Poland and Hungary aren't anywhere near there. But one of the questions, is, but so yes, I agree. We, we our, our main enemies are, are adversaries in this struggle. It's an ideological struggle. Um, are the totalitarians? But we can't do anything directly to discourage to to build democracy in those countries. My concern is that many of the other authoritarian countries in the middle, like the authoritarian, the, the uh, competitive authoritarian regimes that I spoke about, or some that are no longer very competitive. I mean. Um, we should be working with them, but they, they can slide towards totalitarianism. I, it seems to me that Mr. Putin has some pretty strong totalitarian instincts, that he, he has moved in that direction and could move further. When you, when you kill people on the bridge uh, next to the Kremlin, uh, you know, uh, Nemtsov, I mean, but he's used some pretty totalitarian methods in my view. But anyway, I, uh, I, I, I strongly agree that there is an ideological uh, struggle going on, and that, and that the far end of the spectrum, which is totalitarian, is by far the, worst, the most serious enemy, and that there are many opportunities, and we should engage wherever we can, and have some degree of, I, I suggested. But we can do a lot with those that the We can do a comes. lot, but Mr. Putin has made it impossible to do most of the things we had been doing with groups like yours in Russia. In Russia. Because now they're all, you know, they have to be declared as foreign agents, and their root, their 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 offices are uh, uh, are uh, are looted or are, are um, uh, searched and uh, and ransacked by the uh, FSB, the former KG, the, the new KGB equivalent. Uh, so it's very hard. So yeah. the system triage means that realistically, there are limits on what we can do in Russia. But oh. Russia, I I think there had had Yeltsin not been as uh, chaotic uh, and, and as addicted to alcohol as he was, there might have been some real opportunity for a gradual movement towards the center, not towards extreme democracy, but towards a much more liberal, open system in, uh, in Russia. Individuals can make a huge difference. Yeah, but how so, are terrible sorry, we're, 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 at, we're at our time. We're at 7.30, so we do need to, to call an end to the formal program. We can continue our discussion over, happy over to some wine. Privately. Uh, and, and we have books for sale there. And anybody who wants a signature, so, thank you all for, for coming out this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.